I guess I'm supposed to look at the camera. Hello. Hi, Julie. Hi. So good afternoon and welcome everybody to this afternoon's program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Robert Rosenthal and I'm a board member and longtime journalist and I'm now a board member at the Center for Investigative Reporting. Uh, earlier in my career I did work in Philadelphia and we were not in the same newspaper but uh, we certainly just reminisced about some places we loved in Philly, uh, including cheesesteaks. Uh, without Julie's really heroic uh, journalistic efforts at the Miami Herald, we may never have known what we know today about Jeffrey Epstein. And while, of course, much remains a mystery about Epstein, we know more about his victims and the failure of the judicial system than we ever did because of Julie's reporting. Uh, based on her reporting, a, Julie's new book was published this week, Perversion of Justice, the Jeffrey Epstein Story. And it's, uh, it reads, uh, I'm sorry to say, it's not fiction, but it's true, but it reads like a, a novel. And it's not only a story uh, about what it really takes to be, do great investigative reporting. It's a story about passion, taking risks, the challenges a single mom faced doing this kind of work. Uh, it's a story about what's happened to the uh, newspaper industry in terms of its downsizing. And really it's a story about the role of the press in a democracy. And when people like Julie and the Miami Herald did what they did, it truly makes a difference. So I'm honored to be here today with Julie, and I really heartily recommend this book for a myriad reasons. Uh, so before we jump in, a quick note about today's format. I'm particularly pleased that today represents one of the Commonwealth Club's first hybrid virtual programs since the club reopened earlier this month. That means that we, two things. First, we have a live audience here in San Francisco. Hi, everybody. And viewers around the country watching via, via YouTube. Uh, all of you, no matter how you are watching, can submit questions to either Julie or me. If you are watching online, please post the questions in the chat format of YouTube or Zoom. Those will be brought to me throughout the program. For on-site questions, we may use one of the microphones uh, and we can we go to the audience as well. Cards will also be written and brought up to me. So Julie, uh, as, before we start, I just want to frame what we're going to do today, and I know you've had a lot of interviews, so I'll give you two minutes to rest, but I wanted to read from the preface in your book, because it sort of frames what we're going to be talking about today, and uh, I thought it would just set up what we're doing, and this is, Julie wrote this in the preface, uh, this was only written a few months ago, this book, as I said, came out this week. This is what Julie wrote. The Ju Jeffrey Epstein story epitomizes our nation's lopsided system of justice and how victims of sexual assault, especially those who are young and poor, are discarded, shamed, and mistreated by the very people who are supposed to protect them. Epstein got away with his crimes because nearly every element of society allowed him to get away with them. Professional, legal, and moral ethics were set aside for a broken system of values that places corporate profits personal wealth, political connections, and celebrity above some of the most sacred tenets of our faiths, our teachings, and our democracy. When I became a journalist, I learned that the most rewarding part of my work was in writing injustices for those who could not fight for themselves. Few people seem to recognize that Epstein not only beat the system, but he was probably still hunting, terrorizing, and abusing young women and girls. I would face many obstacles in my path to the truth. I would be attacked by the legal forces who failed their solemn oaths, by the defense attorneys who profited off of Epstein's crimes, by some of those within my own industry who thought that what I was doing was nothing more than a rehash of an old story. So Julie, uh, you've been in this business a while, and uh, like every great story, it has a beginning. Can you take us to the point where you first really got hooked into doing the story, and also about some of the events that already had transpired that you may or may not have been aware of. Well, in late 2016, we were, um, I was in the middle of a long-term investigation into Florida prisons, uh, I, but it, it was winding down and I really wanted to, to try to move on to something different. So I 
you know, I had done some work in the women's prison and I knew that sex trafficking was a real problem in Florida. So I started doing some research on sex trafficking in Florida. And every time I Googled those two subjects, uh, Jeffrey Epstein's name popped up. I read a column by one of our former columnists, Fred Grimm, um, that really took the criminal justice system and the prosecutors in this case to task for how they handled it. Nothing that I read seemed to make sense of it. It, it, it just, here was a man who was accused of molesting countless girls and, uh, you know, he seemed to get away with a slap on the wrist. wrist. So I just started kind of picking away at it and looking at it. And as I was doing that, um, requesting some public records, uh, Donald Trump nominated a man by the name of Alex Acosta to be his labor, labor secretary. Uh, I was aware that a co- by that time, I was aware that Acosta was the prosecutor, former Miami prosecutor who had signed off on this, um, this, you know, lenient plea deal for Epstein. So I watched his confirmation hearings thinking he was going to be grilled over this deal. And to my um, surprise, hardly any of the senators really brought much of it up. And it was clear from the little bit that they did question him about it, that they didn't understand the scope or the breadth of this horrible um, this horrible deal that Acosta had signed off on. And just so, frame it a little bit, because now you're talking about a period that's uh, eight years after the deal. Is that right? So this That's is, correct. So it, it was, this it had was lain dormant years. for eight years, and then you start poking at it again. Yeah, because it was one of those things where I would read a story and I'd think, what? How did this happen? And none of the stories that I read answered how something like that could happen. So I was curious about that fact. And then when this nomination happened, I thought, I wonder what the victims, you know, I w- it, this was a crime that happened 10 years before. This would mean that the victims were now in their late 20s, early 30s. And, uh, you know, the labor secretary uh, post was one with oversight of human trafficking and child labor laws. And I thought, I wonder what Epstein's victims think about um, this man who had allowed their predator se- essentially almost off the hook now taking over the reins of this huge um, department. So ba- the, real, the, the hook for you was empathy and compassion and thinking about these young women and how they might be sitting there thinking about what was going on if they were aware of what Acosta had done in terms of cutting this plea deal with, with, and letting Epstein basically w- almost walk. Right. And then I also saw that Epstein, you know, even though his crime, he had already served the short jail sentence that he had been given many, many years before having been released in 2009. He went back to his jet setting life. It was almost I realized it was almost as if he got to go back to his normal everyday life, um, making money and, and hobnobbing with all these important people. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I bet the girls you know, who suffered this aren't living the same lives that they had led. And that, it, it, in my mind, I'm thinking, I, you know, I, I felt a gut instinct that they were still probably suffering trauma from this. And at this point, from the, from the court filings and documents that you were looking at, because had you begun actually, you know, human sourcing yet, or you just were looking and reading what you, was on the record? I was just at that point, just looking and reading the documents because it was a very old case. And I was looking for a hook, quite frankly, if I wanted to do it. You know, you always have to tell, give your pitch it to your editor and you have to have, you know, some kind of reason for, for looking into a case that's that old. And it was just coincidental that Acosta was nominated right around the time I was poking at it, number one. And and that, um, you know, I... I also saw that there was one lawsuit, a civil lawsuit that was still lingering, mm-hmm. uh, that, that it seemed like why it, it, I wondered why it was hanging on after all these years. And did you at that point know the name of any of these young women or were they were all Jane Doe's in the, in the filings? They were all Jane Doe's. So take us through. Okay. So you're, you've got this, your gut, you're tingling. There's something wrong here. You have a hook in that the U S attorney, who had basically let this guy off. And in the documents you were looking at, I believe there were dozens of young women who had alleged 
that they had been, uh, or that the detectives had found were going to testify that they had been sexually abused by Jeffrey Epstein as, and when they were minors. Is that right? That's correct. So you had dozens of cases. It wasn't one or two or three or four. You, you, and I believe the documents hinted that there were many more. That's right. It, it seemed um, there was information in the FBI. The little bit of FBI information that we had was that these the FBI agents who were investigating it were interested in traveling to New York and New Mexico, which were two other places where Epstein owned homes. And it, while it didn't say why, it was clear to me that they were probably trying to find out whether he had been abusing girls in these other mm -hmm. places. So you have a situation where some of the people in law, for, law enforcement, probably you're wondering, were they coerced or went along with this? And probably others, from your experience, you know, might have been outraged. What steps then you, do you then take to begin finding the human the sources who could be? Who did you who, who did you then go look for? Well, I, I reached out to, first of all, I, one of the other things I noticed about it was that the, uh, you know, as a police, re I, most of my career was meant be, uh, spent being a police reporter, crime reporter. So the first thing I thought, well, the police, you know, who handled, who was the lead detective 10 years ago? Who was the police chief? And in doing my research, I learned that the lead detective of the case, Joe Ricari, had retired and so had the police chief. Mike Ryder, and uh, yet they had never spoken publicly at all about the case. The only public uh, information we had were two depositions that they had given many, many years earlier, um, I think in like 2010. Um, so these were even dated uh, interviews and they were court depositions, which as you probably know, are, are pretty boring documents. Um, and uh, I, I set out really first to try to get them to go on the record. So, so this, I, I'm, I hope this conversation isn't too inside the newsroom, because what I'm really trying to draw out here is how one reporter, one person who's got instincts and passion and guts uh, and a very strong will can truly make a difference. And it applies to many things in life. So you have... You then go, you have a couple of names. They've never spoken on the record outside whatever they did in a, in a document. And how do you go about finding them and then convincing them based on probably their own cynicism about no one's going to do anything about this? What's the process and how long did that take? Well, that process took a lot longer than I expected. Um, you know, I think my editor was getting a little antsy because it was taking so long. I was trying to explain, look, these victims' names aren't in any of the documents. It's just going to be a, a painstaking process to go through all the documents. And basically what I did was started reading everything. And, you know, uh, doing this, as I said, so many years, it's inevitable that they miss a name, <laughs> you know, or they have the first name and not the last name, or they have the first name and then the date of birth. So it was this big puzzle and I did a spreadsheet and I would put what information I had on each victim. You know, it would only be scraps of information. And from those scraps of information, um, I looked at some of the, uh, a lot of these women had sued Epstein in the years since this happened. Um, of course, they were all listed as Jane Doe's, but I would have to read each of those uh, lawsuits in order to get it. I had a file for Jane Doe 1, Jane Doe 2, Jane Doe all the way up to 120 something. And uh, so I would just keep filling these files and I used social media, you know, a lot of these uh, women. For example, if I found one woman on Facebook, uh, let's just say she was, um, you know, Jan Smith. I could look at her friends on Facebook and, you know, it's really kind of creepy at times because Epstein had a certain kind of type. He liked very um, petite, um, blonde hair, blue eyed. I mean, they, they looked very similar. Um, so I would just basically look at their friends who all look, you know, that look like that. And slowly I began to piece together uh, I had a, you know, I just, the list just grew. And by now, you know that in the initial go round uh, in 2005, six, seven, when Epstein was dealing with this and basically got off very lean, leniently, 
he brought in lawyers like Kenneth Starr and Alan Dershowitz. You knew you were going up against inner ship, you know, spaceship Galactica, Galactica, right? <laughs> did that? I mean, what did that mean? Signal to you also? Well, it signaled to me that I better let our uh, executive editor know what I was doing. Uh, so I, I, you know, knocked on um, Mindy's. Um, Mindy Marquez uh, was our executive editor at the time. And, um, you know, I said, look, uh, do you have a second? I want to tell you what I'm working on. And so we just talked about the case and I told them this is this is going to might be a rough one because we're going up some very powerful people and he has uh, a legal arsenal that, <laughs> you know, that potentially mm -hmm. would threaten to sue us. And but I told her the story and I told her about the, the women mm -hmm. and she ultimately said, go for it. And you would, and it, so this is around what point? Two thousand seventeen. Yeah. Early. Yeah. And so you're you're basically going through months and months of reading documents, trying to figure out how to find these Jane Doe's, getting sources, McCarty, Ritter, the the former law enforcement, uh, the the chief, and this is in Palm Beach again, uh, to try and speak to you, and that's, that's months right. of work. Is that right? Yeah, it, it, tracking down the women was the most time consuming and, and trying to get them to talk was right. the most time consuming part of it. So the let me part. let me ask you a question, because, you know, you, in the book, you, you weave in uh, something that I found really interesting and surprising, uh, your own story. You know, you, your family comes in, you're a single mom, your kids become almost second, you know, characters. Uh, and you also talk about your own upbringing. Did, did you... Were you conscious of the fact that there was something in there that you, did you ever think I could have been one of these girls? You know, I didn't. I wasn't conscious of it when I started the project at all. I didn't become conscious of it until I started interviewing women. And especially, uh, you know, I interviewed a couple of their moms and the stories that their moms told me reminded me just of my own mother, you know, and the struggles she had as a single mom. And you know, quite frankly, I, you know, I had a tough growing up and I had put it out of my head. It was sort of like a, a reckoning of my own without me really planning on it that way that I just started thinking about, wow, I remember when my mom had to, you know, work two jobs. She was a waitress part time and she wasn't home a whole lot. And, you know, we were left, we were latchkey kids, you know, and you know, you know, as I said, it slowly dawned on me that I had a lot in common with these women, but I didn't do this story for that reason. I just, you know, it was just, it just kind of happened that way. Well, you know, some of the best journalists have tremendous compassion and, and, and there are victims in any situation. You want to be able to tell their story and hopefully make it relevant so other people can understand what they went through. And that really came through. Julie, take us through, uh, I mean, the, the reporting here, and it's hard to explain, I think, to a non-journalist audience that's, you know, I don't know how many thousands of pages of documents you read, trying to track people down. Uh, I know one of the heroines in the story is the librarian. I think her name was... Uh, yeah. yeah, Monica. Yeah, she... Monica she, Leal. Yeah, I, I felt that, I feel, still feel that uh, librarians don't get a lot of credit in our business, and they're very important um, to what we do. Um, the other real heroine also was my uh, partner, Emily Michaud, who was my videographer and photographer who uh, worked on this project from with me from the get-go and was a real uh, important, uh, you know, it's important to un to hear this story uh, we were we put together the documentaries and, as well as to see the story as much as it is to read the story. Uh, she made these women very um, three dimensional and and very um, you know it, it, no one could tell the story really better than the women right. themselves. And these documentaries did that well. And I think I want to get to that sort of the interview process. But is, was there a point in this early reporting where you suddenly felt outrage or? Uh, pretty much from the beginning, you know, I, I just couldn't, I, it, I was outraged from the very beginning. I just couldn't understand how someone like that could have gotten away with this. Uh, and that's what made me want to do it because I, I, to be honest with you, I felt like it was like an unsolved crime that I had to solve. And I thought, I knew a lot had been written about it, but as I said, I don't think the answers were really known. So I set out to really solve this 
mystery. And you knew, I think, that you had to get as many of these young women, now a little older, on the record to tell their story. So can you yeah, take... Can, yeah. can you take that was us, critical. Yeah, can you, can you take us through how you found the first couple of women and, and what, you know, what, you know, what you had to do to get them their trust? And I think, again, one of the most difficult things a reporter or journalist has to do is uh, speak to people who have lost something victims of something, in this case, uh, sexual abuse or rape, is, is really difficult to win the trust and, and the sensitivity you need to do that. But can you just take it through, through the process and, and at some of the first meetings? Well, I, before I even met with them, I, I had an instinctively, I knew that this was going to be an issue where I was going to be asking these women, whom I had never met before, about the worst time of their life. And I knew that some of them had probably never told anybody that this had happened. They were very young. And I was concerned that I was going to perhaps re-traumatize them. So I, you know, I spoke with some people who do these uh, kinds of interviews for a living uh, to get some insight into how to handle it. And one of the things that I concluded was that I didn't need to force them to talk about the abuse, you know, the physical abuse, that it was more important that I, that I, you know, tell them, look, you don't have to talk about this. There's no question that this happened. You know, Epstein never denied that he did any of this. That was the other thing. He never denied he did it. He once compared what he did to uh, stealing a bagel. You know, he just didn't think what he did that he did anything wrong. So there was never a question that, that this had happened. So I didn't need for them to tell me about the rapes. Um, I just needed them to talk about what it had done to them and how they, you know, were treated by the criminal justice system. Take, take us through the first interview with, with Emily and what, you know, what that was like and your, your own feelings. Well, first of all, the one thing that I did, I, I started thinking this would be like any other story. You go knock on the door and um, you tell the person that you want to interview what you want to talk to them about. And then I, I it, you know, when I did that, one of the women's fathers answered the door and I thought, oh my gosh, this isn't going to work because I can't tell her father why I'm there. You know, she, he might not even know. So I, I had, I did another story before that where I um, wrote the victim of a slain Navy SEAL. I wrote his father a letter explaining what I wanted to do. And, and it, and the father did call me and I got an exclusive interview with them. And, uh, I, so I wrote 60 letters, you know, to all the women that at that time that I had tracked down and, um, included what I wanted to do. I included a, a, a couple of clips about how Epstein, um, had already tried to get his sex offender registration lowered in New York. So he's trying to really weasel, you know, uh, out of any kind of um, restrictions that were placed on him after he got out of jail. So I, I wrote all these letters and I got one woman called me, um, Michelle Licata, who lived outside of Nashville. And she confessed to me that her lawyer told her not to call me and her lawyer told her not to talk to me. And I just had a, you know, a talk with her on the phone and I told her what I wanted to do. And she said, okay, come. And Emily and I didn't know when we set out for, uh, to travel to Tennessee, whether she was actually going to go through with it because we knew she had some misgivings. And, um, we, we sat there and we interviewed her for, oh gosh, it had to be at least three hours. Uh, and it was just extremely emotional um, uh, you know, uh, Emily and I really, I think, didn't really understand the depth of the trauma that, that she and, and other women had gone through. She only went to Epstein one time, by the way. And it just, with that one time, it, it really almost destroyed her life and to hear her tell. And that's one of the powerful parts of the book. I mean, I touched upon that and Emily, of course, did a brilliant job of it in the, in the documentary, but you only get so many, you know, minutes in a documentary and so many inches in a story. So in the book, I was able to really talk about that whole interview and 
you know, and, and with each of these women, their whole story, because it's important to understand that, um, yes, these girls took money, but they were really um, misled. Uh, and they were really, um, you know. Yeah, why, why don't you uh, <clears throat> go into the detail of what the method was? I mean, I, I'm, I don't want to assume everybody understands what was happening here, how, how this, his system basically worked. And how there was, it wasn't just Jeffrey Epstein, there was a whole infrastructure around him. And many, many people were aware of what were going on. Can you just, just describe that for us? What was actually the methodology? Yeah, <clears throat> Jeffrey Epstein had a whole ecosystem around him of people that helped him. I mean, he was a guy that really didn't even tie his own shoelaces. He had, uh, <clears throat> you know, he had somebody to do everything for him. And so these people... Uh, that were part of his, uh, you know, his, his, his life, you know, or this, this system that he had built uh, were, you know, involved everyone from the butler who answered the door with, where these girls were to a chef who was in the kitchen who, you know, made them snacks to the women. Of course, uh, he had other young women who arranged his schedule to the, um, you know, the, the, the housekeepers who cleaned up after, you know, he did th these incidents and uh, the pilots who flew uh, the jets, you know, where he had two private planes, uh, the driver, he had a, he had drivers, you know, that, that picked up the girls. So it was a whole ecosystem around him of people that, um, that, that really aided um, and help this move. Well, also, know. I think the book in the book, you really describe how, in some cases, you, the actual the first meeting where somebody, a young girl, she might be a runaway, she might be in distress, she's somewhere, she needs help. You had, it was almost as if you had, you know, a wounded animal or, you know, I don't mean that, but just somebody and people out looking for the girls who fit a physical description that he, he sought after. I mean, they were out right. hunting, really. That was by design. I mean, he could have had the most sophisticated, expensive prostitutes that his money could buy, but that's not what he wanted. <laughs> he wanted scared little girls. That was, you know, what he wanted. And he didn't even want them um, one, one or two. He wanted a revolving door of them all the time. You know, that was part of his sickness. And, uh, so he, like I said, he, he just had, and then, you know, the, the most insidious thing, part of this of all was when these girls, of course, became like, you know, scared and they didn't want to do it. He said, oh, don't worry about it. You don't have to do it. Just bring me your friends and I'll pay you the same amount of money. So he had the girls that he victimized, didn't want to be victimized anymore, but they needed the money for whatever reason. They were, they were on the street or they were in a foster home. Um, and they just would bring, go to parties and bring their friends or bring not even people that were their friends, people that they would meet, acquaintances that they met in the mall, you know, or uh, at the gym or wherever. So he had, uh, you know, he had a whole legion of, of recruiters. Yeah, and, and we're not even really getting into the, uh, the men, and in some cases, the women who surrounded him, some of the most best known people, politicians, businessmen, uh, you know, corporate leaders uh, who were part of this world in some way. And I guess that's still one of the un, unclear mysteries. Uh, can, you know, there's so much to go to here. Uh, you know, and, and I, I want to sort of try and keep it in a little bit of chronology. But can you also, you know, one of the things that also is quite revelatory in the book was your exploration of the two islands in the Virgin Islands. Can you talk about that and, and sort of what was going on there and how that was part of this world of, of Jeffrey Epstein and his friends? And what also his method of indebting himself to local officials and government people, either through philanthropy or donations or building something, uh, this sort of almost 360 degree system he created. Right. Well, he couldn't have picked a better place um, to you know, further his crimes than this island that he bought off the coast of St. Thomas. Uh, the only way you can get to it is uh, by helicopter or by boat. Um, and he, he, 
you know, it's also a place where the people on St. Thomas are pretty poor um, and um, the politicians, um, you know, he ingratiated himself with the, with the government officials and the politicians. Uh, the wife of the then governor went to work for Epstein. I think she worked for him for, for many years, like 10 years. Uh, so he, and then he uh, donated, you know, tens of thousands, maybe even, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, build schools there, uh, you know, donated, built, you know, the first mu music school, uh, soccer programs. I mean, you just name it. It was just anything that he could throw his money at. So um, inevitably, you know, uh, these people came to, you know, know him as somebody as somewhat of a benefactor and they, you know, turned their, I, you know, turn their heads the other way when he was bringing in all these girls on his, on his private plane, he would fly into the airport at St. Thomas on his private plane and then go to a hangar, you know, an area that wasn't real completely visible to everyone, um, it, disembark with the girls. And then they would ho usually hop on a helicopter that was kept there. And then they, they would be flown to the Island. And, and one of the things you, that you were, I think still looking for, and maybe you're still looking for, are manifests. Is that right? Who flew on these flights and is also who flew around and you've been unable to get a lot of those, right? In other words, who he was flying with and Homeland Security has blocked that. Is that still true? Yeah, because unfortunately, when I started doing this, this was after my series ran and I was trying to get information on that. And I first did the public records request before Epstein's arrest. I did get some of it, uh, but it was heavily redacted. And before I could pressure and get anything more about it, he was arrested. And then, of course, uh, then it was an open criminal investigation and I wasn't going to get anything. Um, I'm told I need to just move my light a little closer here. It, it's getting dark here in Florida. And, and it, so let me just move my light. Excuse me. This is better. <laughs> okay. How's that? A little bit better anyway. <laughs> well, you look good to me. <laughs> so I, mean, you're, I can see you. But so, I mean, so since the, uh, is that because of his death though, is, any, is that stuff now sealed or can you, can anyone get at it? I don't want to. I don't, any I don't think they're going to give us anything on that. Um, you know, I, cause I, I know it, he's, he's gone now, but the case is still open and theoretically, I guess they're still looking at other people besides even, uh, Gielan Maxwell, who, who is indicted mm -hmm. in connection with, uh, his, his sex trafficking operation. You know, one of the things to switch direction a little bit, Julie, in the book, uh, and I mentioned it earlier, what was your thinking as a reporter? I mean, a lot of times in traditional journalism, you sort of, I'll call it behind the curtain. You know, you don't get into your life, your ups and downs, the challenges of being a single mom. Was, was that a decision you wanted to make? Was that your editor, your book editor? Can you get into, because your, your children, as I said earlier, and there's some wonderful scenes there as a parent, you know. Uh, uh, no, uh, you know wh why, why did you do that? Well, my editor, um, I, you know, it was partially my editor thought that th this story, um, and I, I fought it, actually. I didn't want to do that initially. I said, look, I'll, I'll do this. I, I really don't, I don't want to be in the story, you know, and. Then as I was working on it, I, you know, this was around the time of, you know, Trump um, and all the things that he was tweeting out that weren't true and uh, the, the journalists being painted as the enemy of the people. And, uh, you know, after this series ran, I was, uh, one of the biggest surprises to me was how much, um, uh, fan mail, quite frankly, that I got, you know, journalists never get fan mail, uh, but just a lot of, um, uh, you know, thank you notes from people saying, you know, finally, this is what journalism is and, and this is why it's important. And it occurred to me that, you know, journalists aren't always very good at telling people what we do and how we go about it. We just do it. 
And I do think that at this time in history, that it's important that we explain to people what we do because, uh, for you know, because of Trump and because of all the things that have happened, I think uh, a good deal of America has become distrustful of journalists. And so I, I thought maybe I should tell them what I did so they understand this isn't, you know, this isn't an effort to, um, you know, to cover anything up. This is an effort to find the truth. And that's, I think, what most journalists do, you know. And, and so I thought, I'm going to put a little bit of this in here because I just, I think it's part, it's important for our country. And especially given the fact that newspapers, you know, small newspapers all over this country are disappearing, you know. And I don't think the public realizes how um, devastating that is to our democracy that we're losing small newspapers all over the country. Mm -hmm. Well, I, here, here I agree. Uh, and your work certainly shows the difference you can make. Uh, the, you know, one of the, and it's, it's really complicated to get into, I mean, the perversion of justice, you know, I, is I think a perfect title because once you get into this and you see all the things that happen, and it's probably pretty complicated to explain it here in terms of the system and the players you talk about and some of the stuff you had access to and explaining decisions that were made to protect Jeffrey Epstein. And also, one of the things we haven't talked about was the ferocity of his attorneys going after the victims. Yeah. And which is appalling when you read about it. And I don't, can you talk a little bit about that and that, what that did to some of these young women in addition to the initial trauma? Well, just imagine you're 14 years old and you did something horrible that you are very ashamed of and the police find out about it and they come and they knock on your door and they you want to talk to you. And of course, you got to explain to your parents why the police are uh, talking to you and you have to confess, look, I went to this guy's house. I, I thought I was just giving him a massage and here's what happened. And then when that, after that happens, the next thing you know, you have, um, you know, a man that you don't even know, um, just either following you or, or knocking or coming into the little, you know, bagel shop where you work and, and coming and your boss is standing there and, and it's official looking man. And he said, we need to talk to you. And then it turns out it's a private investigator that's working for Jeffrey Epstein and they want to sit down with you. And then they tell you, look, if you, uh, basically they tell you, if you work with us, you'll be fine. And if you don't work with us, then, uh, you're not going to be fine. And your family might not be fine or, or your father is followed and he, he there's headlights in his rear view mirror and he, you know, they run him off the road. I mean, this, this was really happening with these victims and the fact that prosecutors knew that it was happening and they didn't do anything to stop it uh, is, is just, um, I don't even know what the words were for it. I was just so, uh, shocked. Have any of those people can you, been held to account? I know several lost their jobs after your stories came out. But in the, after the initial go around, really nothing happened to anybody. No, no. I, you know what? The only people um, really who have paid a price in this whole thing are women, uh, from the victims to, um, you know, even the prosecutors. Uh, the pro and the prosecutors that advocated for them, the, both the state lead state prosecutor and the federal prosecutor mm -hmm. were women. Right. Um, but, um, you know, the cases went nowhere because their bosses, who happened to all be men, um, sort of, you know, excused what he did and said, look, these victims aren't credible. Uh, they're prostitutes. Uh, you know, um, it wasn't a big deal. Um, you know, there were all these excuses that were made. Yeah. Can you, uh, getting more maybe, in, talk about um, in, in every story there's also an editor who sometimes is behind the curtain uh you, you your interactions with casey frank are quite candid <laughs> and your thoughts about editors are pretty candid i didn't take any uh, umbrage uh but talk about casey frank and the relationship you had and how that either helped or hindered or you know the whole back and forth well you know it's 
it's, you know, journalism, it, it can be very messy. And especially when you have two headstrong people, I'm very headstrong. And, you know, I'm quite candid about myself as well. I said, you know, that I'm a hard person to deal with myself. Uh, you know, I, um, I wasn't always, you know, I was an editor at one point, like not long because I wasn't very good at it. And, uh, I, I was tough, you know, to, you know, to some reporters and I regret it. Um, and so it, it is this, this dynamic where you're sometimes, you know, at, you know, at cross purposes and, uh, Casey's been my editor for, for probably the whole, almost the entire time, uh, 13 years I've been at the Herald. Uh, we are almost always on the same page with the kind of stories that we think are important, but sometimes the way that, you know, I want to go about it isn't the way that he thinks I should go about it. So, and I, as I said, I'm pretty stubborn and headstrong and so is he sometimes. So we clashed and, um, I was honest about that. And, um, I don't know. I just, I, I, you know, in the end, um, in my acknowledgments, I said, however, you know, he, we would have never had some of the stories that we had if that didn't happen. That it, it, the same thing that made us clash, I think were, were the, was the very thing that made our stories, um, so important. And so, um, you know, just, I mean, we just covered all the bases because mm -hmm. we had to, we had to come together in the end for the sake of the story. Were you able to share your, your fears, I mean, literal fears that you and Emily had during this process? And what did he do to either assuage them or help you? What, what kind of, did you set up a system in case strange things happened or the knock at the door, that type of thing? Well, you, you know, it's funny. Fear. I had some, you know, I had some weird things happen with the prison stories that I had done. I remember calling Casey uh, one time, you know, after someone had showed up in my apartment in the middle of the night. I was pretty scared scared were in the prison series the epstein series i don't know for whatever reason i didn't it i it didn't really spook me until after well after well after the series ran and i was deep into it so i didn't really have a reason to talk to him about that uh emily however uh it was a lot different than i am she she was a lot more um paying attention to, to what was going on. I was a little bit more busy about the story. We're two different personalities that way. So we're a good balance with each other, but she would be like, are you crazy? Why would you do that? You know? So, and the book goes into a couple of those anecdotes about Emily and I with her throwing the furniture in front of the hotel room door and me just falling asleep because I'm thinking whatever, Emily, uh, I, you know, like I said, it wasn't until after you know, we knew that it was really serious that, the, that, that now Epstein was going to be arrested or, you know, the, the Congress had asked for a, a, a Justice Department investigation. That's when weird things started happening. You know, people showing up, uh, van parked in front of Emily's house around the clock, people um, showing up outside my apartment, which is not an easy place to to you know it's not a place that people would be walking by you have to go in an elevator and come up and you know it, it was just odd things look uh, i firmly believe that um there were people that were investigating emily and i it, it just they had to because uh the case had just gotten so hot and epstein from the beginning after the series ran w was afraid that he was going to be charged. I just know that because some people mm -hmm. around him told me he was worried he was going to be charged. Mm -hmm. you explain Bruce Springsteen's role in your work? <laughs> uh, um, you know, just whenever I have a lot of anxiety, I just, I always turn him on and uh, just listen to him. He's, you know, after a long day writing and uh, you know, I, I grew up, as you, you know, we mentioned earlier in Philadelphia, and I spent my summers at the Jersey Shore. And it just, you know, he's a great storyteller, you know, he's brilliant. And I think his stories just helped make me, um, he comforted me in some way. And so especially when I was writing the book, I was listening, I, I would, after a long day of writing, I just would turn on um, Sirius radio and, and just play him the whole entire night to the point that my kids were like rolling their eyes, like, please, mom, do we have to really listen to Bruce Springsteen again? You know, kind of thing. So it was, it was kind of part of the, you know, 
the fabric of my life when this story was unfolding. And, you know, it's a very dark story. It's a very, um, you know, people said, how did, how did you do this? This is really like a, uh, you know, you could really get depressed doing this. And I think just, it was something that helps keep me going kind of. Yeah, it is a dark story. And I'm going to get back to darkness now. Uh, near the end of the book, one of the chapters is, did Jeffrey Epstein did not kill himself. Uh, so that's a statement. And I, so can you explain and take us through either the process of using that headline or that title chapter, chapter title, or is that something you believe? I, this is what I think. I, I used it sort of because that's what everybody was. It was sort of a thing that was all over, um, you know, social media and everywhere. I mean, in our culture, you know, you turned on TV, it was there in the Mardi Gras parade. My son went to Mardi Gras and they had a float of Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein did not commit suicide. It became this, I don't know, this mantra. And you know, I did look at this and people would always ask me when I was doing, uh, was doing a lot of college talks at this time, journalism classes, and people would ask me and, you know, I had to be honest with myself. I, I really didn't think he had, he was capable of, of committing suicide by himself. Now, could he have, um, could it have been assisted suicide? Yes. Um, I, I think if we want to think that, that he wanted to end it, I think someone must have helped him. I just don't think he was capable. I mean, and I'm not the only one that thinks this. His brother thinks that. His lawyers think that. Uh, the forensic pathologist that was at the autopsy doesn't believe that he killed himself. Um, you know, there are just too many strange things that happen. I mean, uh, he had three bones broken in his neck. And Dr. Michael Bodden, the forensic pathologist at the autopsy said, you rarely in, in that kind of a uh, hanging have three bones broken in your neck. Keep in mind, the theory was that he, he um, did this with the bed sheets, um, cutting these uh, up and that he kind of pulled himself against the bunk, he tied it to the top bunk. And he would have had to pull himself with such, I mean, there really wasn't, according to Baden, enough velocity, enough room there for him to have done this and broken three bones. And, you know, the toiletries that were on top of his bunk weren't even disturbed. So, um, and then you have two guards that are asleep at the wheel. Then you have video disappear. Then you find out that, you know, the guy that was in the cell with him was taking out, taken out just hours before this happened. I mean, it's just too, I, you know, I've done crime reporting and especially prison deaths for a long time. And my God just tells me that, that this was not, you know, uh, just a suicide that he do, did by himself. Well, the way you wrote that chapter is certainly all these questions you're raising are laid out in a really coherent way. Now, there is some, there is an inquiry, isn't there? Is, or is that the, the U.S. Attorney's Office is supposed to be doing something? Is New York on, is that yeah. happening or is, do you have any well, idea? New York is looking at, um, you know, the two corrections officers that were on duty um, already struck a plea deal. So they're quiet. Here we go again with everything that's being sealed and Nobody's talking about that part of it. And then uh, there's a separate Justice Department investigation by the Inspector General of the Justice Department that is still ongoing. I don't know why it's taking this long. Uh, so that's still open. So, you know, and a, even if the ruling comes out, whatever that ruling is, I don't know whether the evidence will ever be made public. Yeah, that's the, as you allude to. What, what, let's, you know, jump more to the present now. Uh, Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, will you be covering her trial? And what do you think will be coming out of that? Well, um, Ghislaine Maxwell is sort of taking a page out of the Jeffrey Epstein defense playbook in that she's hired some very, a team of very high powered lawyers who have uh, justice, uh, previous experience in the Justice Department. And, uh, you know, they are bombarding the prosecutors with all kinds of paperwork, you know, motions and uh, just anything that they can kind of throw at the wall, hoping that it's going to, um, you know, they're looking for uh, some kind of a loophole. They're, uh, they're, they're going to inevitably argue that she was 
part of that original, you know, in the original uh, deal that Epstein struck in 2008, there was this strange uh, sort of codicil to the deal where uh, he, uh, his co-conspirators, four of whom were named, they were four women who helped him with the schedule, uh, were given immunity as well, as well as some unnamed people that we still don't know who they were. And that her lawyers will argue that she was one of those people. Now, whether that'll stick uh, remains to be seen. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, Acosta really shows up in this again and again. And, there's, you know, the uh, Justice Department, I mean, one of the details in the book you wrote, uh, did a review and basically found him making uh, guilty of poor judgment but no ethical lapses. And then there's a footnote in that report it says that uh, many of his emails have vanished. Yeah, I mean, they have. They didn't say anybody else has disappeared. Yeah. And it's not just his emails. It's his emails during the period when this deal was done have vanished. So, you know, was, I guess it wasn't like they said, well, he had a major loss of all his emails. It was the emails during the period when this deal was negotiated that disappeared. Yeah. So in Epstein's will, which he wrote a couple of days before he was found dead, right? He, he listed his net worth, I think, at what, he's $578 million. Okay, Now, okay. I think you said in the end of the book, and these numbers may have changed, that a victim's compensation fund was created, and that I think you said 175 women have filed claims as alleged victims, and so far $67 million has been paid out. So are those women you were aware of, or what's the process there? Can you talk about that? Well, we don't really know a lot about them, but I know some of the lawyers <laughs> who represented them, and these are women, some of whom, by the way, um, um, have said that Epstein essentially trafficked them out to some of these important men, <laughs> but they are afraid to come forward. I mean, you look at someone like Alan Dershowitz, who has attacked the woman that was mm -hmm. um, that ac accused him uh, for years. I mean, he has sued her. He has, <clears throat> I mean, he has made her life really uh, miserable. And I even got, <clears throat> when this was happening, I even got um, emails and <clears throat> a couple of phone calls from some people who knew Alan Dershowitz and said that they would never say anything about what they know because they're, we're afraid of them, you know? And that's what these women's, uh, these attorneys who represent some of these women said that they, they're never going to go public because they're too afraid of what the men uh, will put them through. Yeah. When you read the book, the list of men who allegedly were involved here is fairly astonishing. Uh, and the denials everywhere. And then also, what seems to be some very strong evidence from some of these women, and also the pattern. The pattern is there. It's not like necessarily even one-offs. I mean, you really establish patterns here, which you must have seen in the reporting. Yes. I, you know, it took a while to put a lot of it together because not all of it was in one place. You know, there were different, um, you know, there was a state investigation, the federal investigation, then the FBI report, <clears throat> then the civil lawsuits. And so there were a lot of different pieces. And, and I think that that's another thing, um, another piece of it that I kind of put together in this book, because, you know, when you're a, when you're doing a piece like this, there's so much information and you can't always put it, everything in the story. So this kind of delves more into some of those details that I couldn't include in the original story. You know, for you, do you, are you, do you feel like you're done with this or there, are you look, you still want to be engaged? I mean, now you're, I guess you're starting a book tour or at least a virtual book tour. You, I'm sure you're exhausted. Uh, <laughs> You know. you know, I want to see it through, uh, but I, I'm also mindful, you know, I, I, one of the other things I talk about in this book is how I was on other stories. You know, some people said, well, it must be nice to do that. And nothing else. Well, that's not how it worked. I, I was doing the Parkland uh, shootings. I was doing the shooting at the Fort Lauderdale airport. Um, I was covering other things when this happened. And, you know, we just unfortunately had this horrible tragedy here in Surfside and, um, you know, 
when we're, you know, when you work for a paper, you know, a smaller paper, you, you just don't have the luxury of just going off on one thing. I probably have a little bit more of that luxury than other reporters, but, um, you know, you, you really have to, to, to join in on the coverage. You just have to. Yeah, I'll give so, you, for the audience, some context, you know, 20 years ago or so, Julie would have been what they called detached just to work on this and had the freedom to do it. But these days, as newsrooms are about probably a fifth of what they were. So sometimes it's all hands in, even on when she's in the middle of a huge and important story like this. So again, I just think it uh, speaks volumes about your persistence and your work ethic and your determination uh, to do this. And I, you know, I know what, how difficult that is, and I respect the hell out of it. Um, you know, there's some, here's a question from the audience, uh, and you've touched on it a couple of times, but what are some of the questions remaining mysteries, you know, about what Jeff Epstein that you wonder about and that you have any potential hope anything will come out? Oh my the, God. the loose threads. Yeah, I don't have enough time for, for all that. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I think one of the things, um, for example, is, uh, you know, didn't anybody keep track? Here was a guy who, who was a, a convicted sex offender, accused of molesting girls, and he gets out of jail in 2009, and nobody's paying attention to where he's flying his plane and who's on his plane. I mean, it's just mind boggling to me. Does anybody watch these? people when they get out, you know, and make sure that they're not, you know, getting other girls from, you know, Eastern Europe and bringing them to our country. It just seemed to me that he wasn't having any problems after he got out of jail. He returned to his regular life and no one was paying any attention to him. So, you know, that's one thing I think should absolutely be looked at. I mean, why weren't they checking his plane when he got off in St. Thomas and asking those girls how old they were? Yeah, that that's one really jumped out. And I think in the book, you also show that there were, there were in fact, young women or girls brought from overseas uh, to right. New York. And, and the who's who, can you, go, can you talk a little bit about the who's who uh, of the mansion in New York? And also one of the details, I think, in one of the hearings to uh, not give him bail when he was still alive was that the assistant U.S. attorney described how in the Manhattan mansion there were, they found hundreds of thousands, not thousands, hundreds of thousands of photographs of semi-nude, you know, 13, 14, 15-year-old girls. And right. I don't know what that indicated. And also a trove of diamonds, you know, right. in the safe. I mean, right. uh, but what, I mean, the New York mansion also, I mean, you, well, we know you write about some of the people who went there, including Bill Gates and I think, you know, other elected officials. Prince Andrew and, um, you know, um, you know, and the people that flew on his plane, you know, Bill Clinton, um, Trump flew, flew on his plane. Um, you know, all these people were in and out of, uh, you know, his life over this time period when he was involved with this sex trafficking operation. Um, you know, the victims, some of them have accused some of the men of being involved. Um, of course, we, you know, this is a crime that, you know, doesn't really have any witnesses. You know, when you're in a room with a man doing this to you, there's really nobody there uh, to corroborate it, except for, of course, Epstein, who's gone now. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk of videos, whether they're, whether he had videos, um, you know, compromise on some of these men. I mean, we really don't know for sure. I've heard different things from different people. Uh, but, you know, it makes you wonder whether anybody else is really going to be held accountable. Are you still getting tips and leads on this from people out of the blue? Yes. Yeah, I just got a couple this week because the book is getting some press and I'm hearing from people saying, you know, call me. I, I know this. So I'll call them all and, you know see if any there's any truth to to you know their tips um usually as you know when you have a story like this you know i would say 80 90 percent of them are are not good good information but you, if you get one or two percent that that make a difference one of the tips that i did get after this series ran was the one about the saint thomas airport um air traffic controller had called me or a friend i should clarify it was a friend of an air traffic controller who told 
him that this air traffic controller had seen him disembark his plane mm -hmm. with a bunch of girls. Well, in t t talking about sources, you, you write a chapter there about a couple of really sketch characters, uh, Patrick Kessler and Mark Dugan. I mean, yeah. those two, I mean, yeah. what, what do you make of that? I mean, it was almost like they're planted or they were just, what do you think? <sighs> I, I just had to include it because the story is so bizarre. It's almost like if you did a movie about it, you wouldn't believe that these characters actually existed, but they really did. And, you know, the New York Times did a whole, um, you know, story about the Patrick Kessler, which I knew about as it was unfolding. But, uh, you know, quite a few people told me that they thought he was a phony. So I just kept thinking, uh, you know, why is the New York Times still pursuing it? Because everything I was hearing anyway tell, was tell us a little detail about what that he, what he was up to, Kessler. Well, he, he claimed that he had video that somehow he had gotten a hold of these uh, long lost Epstein video that he had uh, either helped Epstein. I'm trying to remember the details, but he had helped Epstein catalog them or hide them or something to that effect. Uh, the name he was, you know, a made up name. Uh, he he basically uh, showed some of the stills from the video he had to uh, two of the lawyers that represented uh, Virginia Jufre, who's, who's uh, one of the uh, victims and uh, it implied that, uh, you know, that this was finally evidence against some of these famous men. And it, it was these videos of some of these famous men. Uh, that were allegedly involved. And ultimately, he never produced it. The lawyers wanted to authenticate the videos that he claimed he had, and he never produced them, and he just disappeared. So, you know, he, it, you know, the thought was that he, he was just a phony. You know, And you have several characters throughout the book who raise allegations, disappear, and, yeah. I, and it's almost, you. I think a couple of times you say that it was almost, in, could have been entrapment also from... From right. Lawyers. right. I suspect that they were trying to entrap um, David Boyes, who, um, you know, represented Virginia and was the nemesis and remains the nemesis of Alan Dershowitz, who, you know, he, right after that happened, he filed a motion in his court case against Virginia that, you know, a, a, involving this Patrick Kessler thing mm -hmm. about how Boyes had tried to, you know, use this somehow uh, to blackmail him mm -hmm. or others, which was really uh, my research and my, you know, interview showed that was not the case. I was talking to David Boyes while this was happening and David was telling me the guy's a fake. So, um, you know, it's just, I think just uh, the whole story is filled with these characters and these connections. And in the middle of it all are these women that, that really have never found justice. And that's the sad part about this. Yeah, I think there are uh, actually some hero lawyers as well or, or who did the right thing. I mean, we didn't really talk about Brad Edwards, who I think was really crucial to this in terms of the civil suit cases he filed. Right. And hopefully the reader, people will read the book and learn that. But I do want to end, and we're getting near the end, uh, a couple of questions. The, one of the, near the end of the book, you talk about the reckoning. That's the chapter. And in that some of the young women actually, it's not that they're, they find retribution or whatever, but, or even healing, but they're, they're given an opportunity. Can you talk about that and that scene in that courtroom? Yeah, it, it was right after Epstein um, died and uh, they were going to, it was just a, it, you know, normally this kind of hearing is just a formality. It was to just for the judge to drop the case. Essentially, there was no more case because he had died. Uh, but the judge wanted to give the women an opportunity to say their piece, to speak about what had happened to them. So uh, quite a number of them showed up for this hearing. And the first thing you notice is they were very still very similar in the way they carried themselves and they looked. They were, you know, you could tell they had model postures and they uh, they were very slim and most of them were blonde and um so it was like you could tell because they were all looked alike. And I think that, you know, I, I, you know, quite frankly, I went to the ladies room one time and I could hear them talking to each other. And they're sort of saying, yeah, I remember you. Do you remember this? And uh, they had this they were starting to form this bond. They had been through something so horrible together. 
And some of them had never met each other before, but they knew some of the same women or they knew um, Maxwell or they knew uh, people that were in that orbit that had um, answered the door or helped schedule them. So they were finding this common ground that was, and they were using it to, to support each other. It, it yeah, was, and, that, and that day in court, they were actually able to testify to what had happened to them, not in the specific detail of the a, an act, but just the process and who they were brought to them, that they were victims. They were testifying as victims, really, for the right. first time. And right. you, I think in the courtroom, there were dozens that day, and only a few ended up testifying. Is that right? That's right. Um, well, there were quite a number who, who, who spoke out. They, not all of them wanted to identify themselves, which was understandable. Uh, it was very emotional. You know, some of them, and I go into this in my book, some of the stories that they told were, were horrendous, you know, about how they were taken advantage of. No, I'm not just talking about sexually, but mentally. The yeah. mental aspect of this is, is just as important almost almost as important a component of what he did. He, he mentally uh, manipulated them. Well, as a society now, we're hearing more and more about this, unfortunately. And, and uh, we, this is the last question, Julie. I know you've been going all day, and it's evening in Miami. Uh, is there going to be a movie, and who's going to play you? Oh, gosh. I, 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 there's going to be a... Um, there were HBO, uh, Adam McKay, the director... Um, is working on a uh, series, a limited series for HBO about it. And uh, I'm helping with the, the script. I'm being interviewed all the time by the screenwriter. And uh, we always joke on who's going to play me. And I, I just, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, I guess. Um, well, maybe Adam, you have a new career on the, on the big screen. I don't uh, think so. I don't think so. I'm not very uh, articulate, as you can tell from this interview. I'm uh, you've been I, great. Not. Well, we're going to end it now. And I, I really, truly want to thank you for your work. Uh, you've made a big difference. Uh, you've had a great career, and I'm sure there's a lot ahead of you. And you've overcome your persistence in overcoming obstacles, uh, as I said, is inspirational uh, for a lot of people, uh, and journalists especially. Uh, we could have gone much longer, and I just recommend the book for anybody, and I want to thank you for joining us today for this really important conversation. I want to thank our audience here in San Francisco and online around the country. Uh, the program today will be available as a video and podcast on the club's website, www.commonwealthclub.org. And I'm Robert Rosenthal, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Have a good evening. Thanks. See Thanks. ya. Bye-bye.